Welcome to Conline Critic Critic, the show that gets facts wrong about your favorite conline critic. I'm Stealthy Septile, and in this episode, we'll be looking at the most superficial commentator on conlang since the idiotic B. Gilson, Jan Misili. I'm a bit excited, because this episode is a first in a few ways. It's the first episode of Conline Critic Critic. That's about it. Jan Misli is a YouTuber who makes a variety of videos about whatever they're passionate about. But what first threw their channel into the limelight was Conlang Critic, which at its peak was the most popular and objectively best show for reviewing Conlangs. It was also the only show that reviewed Conlangs. I want to preface this by saying that this video is not meant for people who don't know who Jan Misli is, or even what a Conlang is. To avoid hearing me speak what appears to be complete nonsense, click off this video as you please. I also mean no personal disrespect to Jan Misli with my relentless nitpicking. That aside, I'll be reviewing every episode of Conline Critic made by Jan Misli. That's right, the perfect language Kida Epic Kizu doesn't count because it was made by Jan Mike Wazowski. I'll be going through episodes in order and ranking them against each other, as well as giving them a rating of good, okay, subpar, or bad. With that introduction out of the way, let's get to Conline Critic critiquing, starting with episode 1, the Lojban episode. Everything about Lojban is meant to be completely unambiguous. However, the question is, is it even a good language? What kind of segue is that? Regardless, Lojban's entire purpose is to function as a test for the Sapir Whorf hypothesis, by being drastically different from any natural language, and critique the phonology and vocabulary all you want, but Lojban succeeds in this department. Any conlang can be considered good, so long as it achieves its own goals. Most early conlang critic episodes fail to understand this. A conlang critic episode without a sound chart is immensely cursed. Like, why is the schwa phonemic? Because why the heck not? This is mostly a consequence of Jan Misli treating Lojban like an IAL, but it's a fine sound to have if you're not going for maximal pronounceability and want a sixth vowel. While it is a very easy sound to make, when trying to make it intentionally, most people end up saying something like ah or uh rather than uh. It's a bit ironic that when attempting to show a sound similar to schwa that isn't schwa, they pronounce the schwa sound anyway. Especially if they speak a language that doesn't have a schwa sound at all, like Spanish or Arabic. A handful of colloquial Arabic dialects actually do have schwa in them, including Moroccan Arabic and Najdi Arabic. The Lojban word for mother is mamta, which does in fact sound a lot like muchin, mother, man, madre, mama, and um, without sounding too much like any of them in particular. Mother in Arabic is um, not am. Um. More seriously, Lojban has this problem where some, but not all, place names and language names are considered part of the normal vocabulary. While having some, but not all, place and language names be part of the vocabulary isn't ideal, I'd say it isn't a big enough deal to warrant the transition more seriously. Also, la hanguk should have a glottal stop preceding it. Lojban has simple words for I am being sarcastic, and I am trying to be funny, and even a pair of words that mean I'm about to say something that isn't in Lojban, and don't worry, I'm speaking Lojban again now. I'd say the interjections, no matter how silly, are fine? They don't cause any ambiguity, and work different from how natural languages work, so they follow Lojban's goals perfectly fine. Regardless, predicate logic alone doesn't work as a grammar. Nobody's brain works the way Lojban thinks brains work. That is the whole point of the darn conlang, you goofball! Overall, this episode isn't good. It spends its time making petty nitpicks and criticizing things that, based on Lojban's goals, don't necessarily need criticism. The production quality absolutely does not hold up in the face of future episodes, and it's one of two conlang critic episodes I consider to be outright bad. All in all, I'd say I like this episode more than the endless void of nothingness, making it the best Conline Critic episode reviewed so far. Based? Yeah, we're looking at Aoi. Oh, here, I'll make a table for you. That'll be a lot easier than me just articulating all of them in alphabetical order. The birth of the Jan Misli consonant chart! This is a pretty ordinary set of consonants. It's actually almost identical to the one we saw in the first episode, and all the problems there apply here too. First off, this assumes people must have watched the Lojban episode, which I'm willing to bet a few thousand people haven't. Second, I think if you're trying to go for universal communication, while also having one letter per morpheme, this is a good balance between having many sounds while not being overwhelming. Besides the ha ha distinction, and well, the entirety of the vowels. Ah yes, centralish vowels, which include i and u for some godforsaken reason. Also missed opportunity for Jan Misili to note that seximals should have been used instead of decimal to minimize the amount of number words needed. Aoi was not requested by anyone. 
Yanami Sui really went and did an episode of it entirely on their own volition and said, Since it's kind of hard to find information about Aoi online, I don't really have that much else to say about it. Besides that, this episode is fine enough. Its criticisms are more fair this time around, particularly with pointing out Aoi's Anglo-centric grammar. All in all, I'd say I like this episode more than I like the Lochmon episode, making it the best Conline Critic episode reviewed so far. Black Gill. I'm a bit excited because this episode is a first in a few ways. This is a classic episode. Everything about it screams iconic. It's the first episode that was requested. Thank you, JCBK. I find it insane that out of all Conlangs to be requested first, Vakil was the one. I mean, Esperanto was probably requested first and Yam easily wanted to save it for later, but I digress. Again, a better version would look something like this. Actually, you could probably even get away with something like this. Yanam Easily, why would you suggest the three vowel system for an English-based IAL? What the heck is wrong with you? After assigning most letters to the sounds they typically make in English, though the use of the letter U for the sound uh is a little weird, Vakil still has some letters left over. So it uses C for the sound sh, X for the sound f, and Q for the sound mm. Also, side note, I feel like C for th and X for sh would have been a better orthography than the other way around since those letters actually make those sounds in some natlangs. C for sh is only used for the romanization of tamazicht, and sometimes is in English in words like ocean, but I'd argue it is not intuitive for English speakers at all. I mean, it's not like Eisenman doesn't know what type of sound is, right? I mean, as we can clearly see from this table he made, it's obviously a glottal approximant. <sighs> Saying the glottal fricative as a sigh is an underrated joke. Oh, well... Guess there aren't any third-person pronouns in Vatgil. Doesn't say that anywhere in the reference grammar, but I guess the inclusion of this one feature that literally every natural language has is where Vatgil draws the line. A suffix that makes a noun plural that's pronounced differently depending on the voiciness of the noun's final sound? Obviously. Passive and gerund forms of verbs? Would barely be a language without them. Third-person pronouns? Um, wow, anglophone much? Uh, not every language works like English, you know. Although it is hilarious that Yam easily completely snaps at at Vakil's lack of third-person pronouns, there are a good number of natlangs without them that use demonstrative pronouns instead. So for a wannabe minimalist language, this is fine. When I started learning more about Vakil on the other hand, I started liking it less. Oh, it's based on English and nothing else. Oh, the writing system is made of dots. Oh, there's no third-person pronouns or names. Oh, it's optimized for communication in Minecraft. You say it's optimized for communication in Minecraft like it's a bad thing. Overall, a very fun time. Super entertaining to see Jan Misli rip the entire language to shreds. This is older Conline Critic at its best. All in all, I'd say I like this episode more than I like the Aoi episode, making it the best Conline Critic episode reviewed so far. I'm Jan Misli, and in this episode, we'll be looking at the language of perception, Laidon. There's not too much to note here. I agree with most of the notes and criticisms. As for the orthography, my only real problem with it is the digraphs. Like, if Ladon had a larger inventory, the use of sh for sh, for example, would make perfect sense, but Ladon isn't using sh to distinguish between s and sh. In fact, the letters s, z, and t only appear in digraphs. This could have been avoided entirely if Ladon instead did something like this. Personally, I do not like their revised romanization. It's mostly tolerable, but why the heck would you use c for sh? So it would be completely naturalistic for Ladon's four tones to be written something like this, or even worse, like this. This phrasing implies that having one diacritic per toneme is bad or aesthetically unappealing, which like, no? Instead, Ladon takes advantage of the fact that it only has two tone levels, and writes the middle tone with no diacritic and the high tone with an acute, and writes the rising and falling tones with two letters each. This works perfectly for Ladon, and even works better than the way a lot of natural languages write tone. I don't think Ladon's system quote-unquote works better than how natural languages write tone. It works about as well, I'd say. It's going to be hard to compare Ladon directly to Lojban, Aoi, and Vatgil. All of those languages were similar enough to one another in what they were trying to accomplish. No? Lojban is a social experiment, Aoi is a language for universal communication, and Vakil is Vakil. And even though it does fail to be completely unsexist, that's not really any worse than Lojban failing to treat all country names the same way. Lojban treating country names differently is nowhere near as bad as being sexist! All in all, I'd say I like this episode more than the Aoi episode, but not as much as the Vakil one, making it the second best Conline Critic episode reviewed so far. I'm Jan Misoli, and in this episode, we'll be looking at the Linux of Conlangs, Igaday. 
Ah yes, Igede, the language of extreme Islamophobia. As you might have noticed, there's something a bit off about this inventory. I mean, just two episodes after I make fun of Jack Eisenman for accidentally calling the sound a glottal approximant, here I am, very intentionally, calling it a guttural non-stop obstruent just so I can avoid having the chart look like this. Ugh, just look at how out of place those post-alveolar affricates look. It's probably a better idea to merge stops and affricates than fricatives and affricates in the chart, and keep labeling huh as guttural. Also, are you saying the consonant chart being out of place like it's a criticism? And it's allowed to be voiced because, and this is the real reason, sounds too similar to f, right? Actually, a few Chinese dialects merge standard Chinese fa and ha, so the distinction isn't entirely of least concern. Okay, I'm being a little harsh. This isn't a bad phonology, it's just poorly defined. Oh, so when Lojbon includes schwa, that gets criticized. But when Igede has a distinction between I and E, that doesn't get mentioned? When you're using the Latin alphabet, you're allowed to spell loanwords either phonetically or the way they're spelled in their source languages, which makes a lot of sense. Oh, so when Zayse does this, it gets criticized, but when Igede does it... Sorry, I'm being too nitpicky. Also, I just realized Nowicki, or Nowitzki, as it should be pronounced, is a very Polish surname, which explains W for V, Y as a vowel, and the Islamophobia. In explaining how Igede's word derivation works, it would have been nice to specifically point out the morpheme boundaries within Igede. This isn't a bad episode, but I can't help but think about this language's Islamophobia, and Yam easily feels far too nice to Igede as a result. All in all, I'd say I like this episode more than the Loshban episode, but not as much as the Yaoi episode, making it the fourth best Conlang Critic episode reviewed so far. Conlang Certic. This timestamp is just Jan Measley pronouncing consonants, making up about 7.56% of the entire video's runtime. The lack of highlighting for the sounds really hurts this episode's phonology section. It turned out so bad that in the very next episode, Jan Measley starts highlighting sounds as he says them. Look at all those consonants, and this isn't even including gemination, except where the geminated consonant makes a completely different sound. Oh, gemination is when you say a consonant for a longer amount of time, by the way. This isn't in modern English, but it is in Arabic, Finnish, Japanese, Italian, and several other languages. All that explanation about what gemination is, but no demonstration as for which consonants in Ithquil can actually be geminated. Ithquil isn't about communicating easily, it's about communicating densely, packing as much information as possible into as little space as possible. And if that's the goal, then using every single sound you know how to make makes perfect sense. And that's exactly what Kihara did. Oh, so when Kihara puts in every sound they can pronounce, that's fine, but when Billy Ray Walden... Once again, my problem here is with the digraphs. Now, don't get me wrong, there isn't anything inherently wrong about using digraphs in your conlang for orthography, but using them here seems to go against Ifquil's general philosophy. I mean, Ifquil is all about condensing information, right? So why would you have some sounds represented with more than one symbol? All that does is make words take up more space, which is the opposite of what Ifquil wants to do. Why not show the digraphs whose presence you're critiquing instead of just displaying orthography? It would have been nice to hear an exact description of its own writing system, or to get a sense of its mentioned word derivation system, or hear any part of the grammar that wasn't in the example given, but oh well. Overall, this episode doesn't critique a lot, and it also feels insufficient as a description of Ithquil. It feels like a waste doing this episode so early when the production quality was lower, instead of waiting for season 3, which would have done it justice. Still, props for being the best video about Ithquil done by a YouTuber with a sizable audience. All in all, I'd say I like this episode more than I like the Lojban episode, but not as much as the Igade one, making it the fifth best Conlang Critic episode reviewed so far. Wolflandic is an artlang created by Ian Foster in 2016 and was heavily influenced by Greenlandic. You might have noticed that Ian Foster also happens to be the person who requested this episode. Ian's Tales profile picture is free serotonin. Ah! We go from the episode of Young Jan Measley ignoring the word for Islam in Igade to the episode where Jan Measley casually says that one slur relating to Inuit peoples. Okay, if you ever decide you want to re-redo Wolflandic's inventory, here's a good set of consonants for you to start with. The ones in italics are the ones where it makes just as much sense to keep them as it does to remove them. Besides suggesting to cut down on the alveolar stops, I don't think it makes too much sense suggesting more changes to the phonology. This appears to be a conlang created for the fun of it, and if Ian Foster wants a given phonological inventory, then so be it. Here's how you can conlang better next time. First, keep the phonology simple. The more sounds you have, the harder things will be. But what if you subjectively prefer larger phonemic inventories? Also, fun fact, Ian Foster has still been working on Wolflandic. It's a bit weird to see Yam Easley being so nice in an earlier episode of Conlang Critic, but I think I like that. Besides that, though, this episode feels somewhat lackluster even compared to the earlier Conlang Critic episodes. 
All in all, I'd say I like this episode more than I like the Ithquil episode, but not as much as the Igaday one, making it the fifth best Conley Critic episode reviewed so far. Thank you to... Actually, nobody wanted this. I'm Young Measley, and in this episode, we'll be looking at the useless language worth less than $10, K-Bop. Actually, K-Bop isn't the full name. It's an official name, but it's really just a shorter version of Kaden Sanap Vlir Sang Esu Vom Nag Vlim Kase Nakega Bop Vegdaf Shofkom Vlimga Vlimga, which I am not saying again. The only complaint I have with the K-Bop episode is that the orthography is not well described, especially in not mentioning how the Phoenibic hats are written. Besides that, I hardly have anything to say. This episode does a great job describing the silliness of K-Bop, and leaves little more to be desired. It's an accurate and fun episode. But enough of my thoughts, let's hear what someone else has to say about the K-Bop episode. Greetings, it is I, Daniel, creator of K-Bop. Uh, in general, I think Jan Misley's video about K-Bop is, is quite good, and when I want to introduce someone to K-Bop quickly, I usually send them that video instead of anything that I've made. Because uh, it just presents the information much better than I do, which is actually part of the joke. Uh, like, yeah, Anne Meisley, uh doesn't like my orthography, but part of that is just the documentation is terrible, and in world the orthog the Latin script is kind of my own and is supposedly my own invention, maybe sort of, and thus it's just the pronunciation guide is I'll do it like English. Uh, Though, when I started making uh, Learn K-Bop videos, I went back and looked for the Chinese characters that he talks about in the video to see, oh, where did I use those? What was I thinking? And just give pronunciation guides for them. And I discovered that uh, there are no Chinese characters. Uh, he just gaslit me for four years into thinking that I had put Chinese characters into my own language. No, they're IPA characters that... When he viewed my files, there was a text encoding issue. <laughs> um, other than that, my only other comment is I have come to realize that I think his terminology for the interesting consonants uh, needs some uh, adjustment. So he calls both this, so he calls this a click and this a stop. Um, but actually, in fact, I think both of them are clacks because a stop implies that there is airflow and a click implies that there has been a vacuum. So a bi-manual click would actually be this. Where, so a clack is two articulators just smacking into each other, which would also be useful if you needed to uh, describe the phonetic inventory of a language that involved prehensile walrus tusks. But yeah, overall, I think uh, the video is quite an excellent uh, description of a bop as a language. Uh, bye. I'd also like to say if you're interested in K-Bop, Daniel Swanson has a fun series of K-Bop lesson videos on his channel, which you should totally go check out. All in all, I'd say I like this episode more than the Laudon episode, but not as much as the Vakil one, making it the second best Conline Critic episode reviewed so far. I'm Jan Misely, and in this episode, we'll be looking at one of the two conlangs people who know nothing about conlangs are sometimes vaguely aware of, Klingon. There is a noticeable decrease in audio quality from the last episode. Huh. Well, it sure doesn't sound like English, but, like, is that it? The way Klingon tries to seem inhuman is having a lot of guttural sounds? And a couple retroflex consonants? Klingon definitely could have sounded more alien, but I think given the time period it was made in, the phonology gets the job done, at least with the consonants. The vowels could have sounded infinitely more cursed. Of course, if it were from a natural language, it would probably be described like this, but with some footnotes explaining the subtle differences. Looking at it this way exposes just how normal this is. Because you literally changed the phonology! And even then, you called an inventory with the voiceless velar affricate ka normal. The chart also goes out of its way to make the phonology seem more symmetrical than it actually is. Klingon's consonants would be more accurately transcribed like this. So, Klingon uses mixed case, like Aoi, but where Aoi used mixed case to get more mileage out of the Latin alphabet, Klingon only has one pair of sounds where case even matters. Some comments have pointed out that the capital letters are there to let the voice actors see which sounds are pronounced like in English. And honestly, the more I think about it, the capital letters looking ugly and out of place actually fits for what Klingon is going for. 
Klingon's vocabulary could have been much, much better elaborated on than just showing three words Jan easily liked. Meanwhile, it's got nominative accusative alignment, a base 10 numbering system, two grammatical numbers, and a suffix you put on the end of verbs to turn them into nouns that mean performer of this verb, all of which are blatantly from English. To me, those features don't seem like they're necessarily just from English. They feel more like standard average European. Overall, the Klingon episode reeks of younger Yam Easily being critical, but not in a super valid or fun to watch way. The thumbnail doesn't even use the Klingon flag, SMH! All in all, I'd say I like this episode more than the Loshman episode, but not as much as the Ithquil one, making it the 8th best Colin Critic episode reviewed so far. I'm Yan Misili, and in this episode, we'll be looking at one of the only things anyone remembers about one of the most successful films of all time, Navi. The audio is funky in this episode too, but it sounds better than the Klingon episode at least. Navi's vowels are E, E, U, E, O, E, A. This is pretty good. It's mostly symmetrical and- What do you mean? There's so much asymmetry if you make the chart more accurate! Well, there's syllabic consonants, cool, and contrastive stress. Oh, and there's also lenition sometimes, so that's cool. That's the thing where consonant sounds are pronounced as different manners of articulation in some situations. You could have given, like, any examples of the syllabic consonants, contrastive stress, or lenition. However, there's some languages that say that the one agent of an intransitive sentence is an object instead. These languages put subjects in the absolutive case and objects in the ergative case. Wrong! The ergative case marks the subject of intransitive sentences in ergative absolutive languages, and absolutive is the object and subject of intransitive sentences. For how much is elaborated on with the nouns, it would have been nice to hear anything about Navi verbs. Overall, this episode feels bare bones. There's hardly any criticism, and while it mentions a lot of Navi's features in passing, it fails as an extensive description of the language. More background about the creation of Navi would have made the review feel more adequate. Like how James Cameron was given a sample of voicing distinction, aspiration distinction, and ejective distinction with the stops, and chose the ejectives because he thought they sounded the best. All in all, I'd say I like this episode more than the Wolflandic episode, but not as much as the Igaday one, making it the 6th best Conline Critic episode reviewed so far. Fluid Lang is an inner lang created in 2015 by uh, Reddit user Andrew the Conliner and has been continuously updated by the Fluid Lang subreddit. I appreciate Jan Meesley's complete disdain for Reddit. Does uh, the Fluid Lang subreddit actually expect someone to be able to distinguish between th and th or between l and r? Ah yes, distinguishing l and r is equally as hard as distinguishing v and va. There's something I'd like to make absolutely clear. If you want your phonology to be international, five vowels is a maximum. Three vowels is the best possible option for an internationalized vowel inventory. For an a priori conlang like fluid lang, yes. For one with vocabulary derived from natural languages though, the five vowel system is just better. Not only is it far better for recognizability, but the vast majority of people speak languages with equivalents to those five vowels. Well, there's this language you might have heard of that's called Arabic. It's one of the most commonly spoken languages in the world, and it's one of many three-vowel languages. Most speakers of modern standard Arabic also speak a colloquial Arabic dialect, and practically all of them have A and O. This episode is alright. It's fun to see them tear into the language, but the lack of examples for grammar hurts its legitimacy. Fluidlang's ranking among the innerlangs is fine, but when re-ranking it in the next episode, why the heck is it ranked above Laudan as an artlang? If you are multilingual and have free time, please help the show become more available internationally by translating the subtitles. If you do, then any request you make for a future episode will count as one and a half requests. I have immense respect for the people who do translation work, and for the time and effort required, as well as the benefit you get for having a video translated, I think that should be increased to at least double, but that's just me. All in all, I'd say I like this episode more than the Aoi episode, but not as much as the Laudan episode, making it the fourth best Conline Critic episode reviewed so far. Real quick before the episode itself starts, I'd like to make a correction. In the previous episode, by which I mean the Fluid Lang episode, I said that Fluid Lang wasn't a good international language, which is true, but as it turns out, that's because Fluid Lang isn't supposed to be an international language. My apologies to Andrew the Conlanger. Proceeds to immediately mislabel Tokipona as an inner lang instead of an art lang. Okamapona tawa sitelantawa conlang critic tawa kulupu sitelantawa ni onali sona ike e toki sin ni onali pona tawa sina. Mian misali a sitelantawa ni la mi looking e toki ni toki pona. 
The opening being in Tokipona is a really nice touch. I'm gonna be completely honest with you, I'm a little biased in favor of this one. A little biased? Learnability is something that Conlang's designed to be used internationally tend to struggle with. I wouldn't say so. Typically, they're decently easy to learn, even if they can be nitpicked as being potentially even easier. The overwhelming majority of natural languages have every single one of these sounds, and every single natural language has the overwhelming majority of these sounds. Except for Central Rotocost, which you literally mentioned in the last episode. As far as I can tell, there isn't a single natural language with monolingual speakers that has fewer syllables than Tokipona. Technically, Maori can be analyzed as having all of its syllables have a vowel, or a consonant followed by a vowel, and under that analysis, Maori has fewer syllables than Tokipona. Regarding the Tokipona adaptations of writing systems shown, why in the living heck would you represent Koda N with Navarana instead of Anusfara in Devanagari? It's so much more cumbersome to type and looks horrendous when coming before Pa, like in Nampa. And for Hangul, why use A for A instead of E or A? You might think that this is really inconvenient, but this sort of workaround helps minimize the amount of grammar you need to learn. They call the grammar simple without saying much about it, not even describing the word order or particles like li, e, pi, and la. As it stands, Tokipona can be described in full on a single sheet of paper with the vocabulary on one side and the grammar and phonology on the other side, an accomplishment that many other supposedly easy conlangs could only dream of. Languages have too much content to describe their entirety on a single piece of paper. Even with Tokipona, you're probably missing all the country and language names, and all the commonly used compound words and phrases. Tokipona has between 120 and 125 words, depending on who you ask. It did in 2017, but now it's more like between 120 and 137 words. And if you're counting more obscure terms coined by various members in the community, it's well above 200 now. And unlike the other languages with absurdly tiny vocabularies we've seen on this show, the way you combine words in Tokipona actually makes sense. Remember one quantity above life to words from the Aoi episode? The Tokipona word for banana is kili palisa, or stick-shaped fruit. Remember good foam food from the Ikide episode? The Tokipona word for pie is pansui, or sweet grain. There's no definitive way to say practically anything in Tokipona. Word derivation in Tokipona can be as logical or illogical as you want them to be. There's nothing stopping you from saying banana as wanmute sewi aletawa, or Mokuko Pipona for pie. For the record, I'm criticizing 2017 Yamisili on this, not modern Yamisili, and this applies to practically all of seasons 1 and 2. The season 2 lineup is neat, but it would have been nice if the memes shown in between were more diverse than half of them being haha the number 42 in Lojban is vore, or if any of said memes were related to the revealed conlangs in any way. Also, does anyone have any idea what these two texts shown during the montage mean? Because I have no hecking clue. Overall, this episode is fun to watch, but purely as a video in a series called Conlang Critic, it doesn't do a good job of criticizing anything about Tokipona. All in all, I'd say I like this episode more than the Laudon episode, but not as much as the K-pop one, making it the third best Conlang Critic episode reviewed so far. There is basically nothing that I can say in this video that hasn't been said before by people who are more qualified than I am. Who are these mystery people you call more qualified than yourself who have criticized Esperanto, and what are their criticisms that you chose not to bring up yourself? And of course, the whatever, Rodic. The letter R in Esperanto is officially an alveolar trill, but it's sort of allowed to be pronounced however you pronounce the letter R in your native language. The biggest problem with the whatever, Rodic, is that it automatically creates a divide in the speaking community, where it's immediately obvious what someone's first language is if they pronounce the Rodic a certain way. No? On both accounts, the most common rhotics are so common that it's hard to guess someone's first language just from the way they pronounce the rhotic. And even if you could guess, any community forming about an international language probably wouldn't mind people who speak different languages natively. Seriously, what's the most common language that's actually compatible with Esperanto's phonology? There's a handful of errors in the section of commonly spoken atlangs not having sounds in Esperanto. Mandarin doesn't have v, most dialects of English don't have v, and even those that do are still missing ui. Spanish doesn't have v, Arabic doesn't have o. Most colloquial Arabic dialects have o. Hindi doesn't have ch, Urdu doesn't have ch. Hindi and Urdu do have ch. Malay doesn't have j, Russian doesn't have h, French doesn't have j, Portuguese doesn't have ch. French and Portuguese don't have phonemic affricates, ch or j but could probably pronounce them just fine as consonant clusters. Bengali doesn't have ch, Punjabi doesn't have j, Japanese doesn't have r. Japanese does have a rhotic, it just doesn't distinguish it from la. Persian doesn't have t, Swahili doesn't have j, Telugu doesn't have h, and Telugu does have h in loanwords. 
Overall though, the section is both hilarious and demonstrates their point especially well. Also a bit nitpicky, but Telugu Punjabi should be pronounced Telugu and Punjabi respectively. And I didn't even look at syllable structure, which by the way is pretty poorly defined, so you end up with a lot of words with difficult consonant clusters like C. This should be unacceptable. Like, I went through 26 languages, all of which have over 60 million speakers, and not a single one is compatible with Esperanto's phonology. You know what language is compatible with Esperanto's phonology? Polish, which happens to be Dr. Laser's native language. There's also the fact that even Polish lacks a H sound distinct from H. So not even that's fully compatible with Esperanto's phonology. Sexism is just one of the negative results that come from Esperanto's derivational system. However, the thing I think is the least excusable about Esperanto's vocabulary is the inconsistent way it handles toponyms. Even more than the sexism? If I had a nickel for every time Dion Misili deemed toponyms more important than not being sexist, I'd have two nickels, which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice. Overall, this episode is actually great because it makes Esperantist angry. It's fun to see Jan Misili talk so much smack about Esperanto, though they do talk a bit too fast and the music at the very end is played too loud. That in mind, I'd say I like this episode more than the Tokipona episode, but not as much as the K-pop one, making it the third best Conlang Critic episode reviewed so far. I'm Jan Misili, and in this episode we'll be looking at Esperant 2, Ido. Ido's consonants are m n b d g p t k t ch v z j f z sh ha w l y a r Jan Misili goes through the consonants here at the speed of light. Ido's orthography isn't great. They call Ido's orthography not great, and then lists only two things wrong with it, which aren't even that bad at all. Everything I said is bad about Esperanto's grammar is absent from Ido. The accusative case is indicated through word order, but it can be marked if you want to, and adjectives don't need to agree with the nouns they modify. That's all I have to say about it, really. Everything else I could say also applies to Esperanto, like how the definite article doesn't really need to exist, or how the prepositions are somewhat confusing. The grammar section goes over enough, but you could have shown anything on screen besides grammar. It's still extremely Eurocentric, arguably even more so. Not really. Name a single non-European root in Esperanto coined by Zamenhof. It's a bit hard to be more Eurocentric than that. Although what Ido does do is remove literally all Germanic and Slavic roots, leaving only romance. Cringe. The music is too loud during the section explaining how Ido handles gender and pronouns throughout the end of the video. Overall, this episode is fine, but its criticism isn't that fun to watch and doesn't go super in-depth about the language as a whole. The best thing about this episode is that it spawned the Anthony McCarthy saga. That in mind, I'd say I like this episode more than the Fluid Lang episode, but not as much as the Laudon one, making it the 6th best Conline Critic episode reviewed so far. I'm the idiotic B. Gilson, and in this episode we'll be looking at a failed oxlang with a name that starts with V and has an umlaut full of book. First off, I really like that the video title has the alternative letter for U. Or in Russian, where Volopyuk refers to writing Russian with the Latin alphabet based on how letters look rather than how they sound. A lot of this was probably due to the sheer novelty of the idea, rather than actual flaws with the language's design. As far as I'm aware, it was the first ever a posteriori auxiliary language, or in other words, the first language meant to be used to facilitate international communication with vocabulary derived from existing natural languages. This concept has been done many, many times, but Volopyuk is where it all started. Does it hold up to modern standards? Let's find out, I guess. It's a bit awkward that the slides pause on Boitetoik for a whole 22 seconds as Yom easily explains other things. You don't really need to look hard to find languages that are incompatible with this. Like, sure, you can kind of map it to English, but for languages like Mandarin and Spanish, you just can't. Eight vowels is simply too many. It's actually somewhat possible to match Volapuk's vowels to Mandarin. The main problem was with A versus A. This is the episode where the pauses between words are non-existent. It doesn't personally bother me much, but is decently noticeable. Volapuk's pronouns could have been represented much more clearly with a chart. Overall, I think the criticisms are valid, and it goes into a reasonable amount of detail with grammar, but any vocabulary examples besides the pronouns, and said vocabulary compared to their source language's words, would have been nice. It does feel a bit lacking as an episode, though, especially without sharing the background information that Schleier originally created Volopuk because he claims to have had a vision from an angel telling him to make an IAL. That in mind, I'd say I like this episode more than the Igade episode, but not as much as the Aoi one making it the ninth best Conlang Critic episode reviewed so far. I'm Nanmi Sili, and in this episode we'll be looking at the voice of dragons, Dovazul. The episode is a little quiet in the beginning. Dovazul is a fictional language featured in The Elder Scrolls V, Skyrim. 
I don't actually know who exactly made it, because they aren't credited for doing so. My best guess is that Emil Pagliarulo, the writer of Skyrim, created the romanized written version of the language first, and then the phonology was made by the voice actors under the supervision of the lead voice director, Wes Gleason. And then the cuneiform style writing system was made by one of the art designers, and then approved by Pagliarulo because he's also the game's senior designer. The phonology was also probably highly influenced, if not made outright, by John Courlander, who wrote the main theme of Skyrim, which is written entirely in Dovazul. The background surrounding Dovazul is very well explained, more so than most earlier episodes of Conline Critic. They could have easily mentioned that the phonology is literally just English, except the creators didn't know the difference between a voiceless and voice dental fricative because they're spelled the same. The episode could have been enhanced by explicitly saying and hammering in just how Anglo-centric the entire language is, instead of subtly hinting at it. Also showing romanizations for like, any of the strings of Dovuzul text would have been nice. Overall, this episode has harsh and valid criticism, but not exactly the type that's entertaining to listen to. That in mind, I'd say I like this episode more than the Ithquiel episode, but not as much as the Wolflandic one, making it the 13th best Conline Critic episode reviewed so far. I'm Jan Misley, and in this episode, we'll be looking at the Between Language, Interlingua. I'm not entirely sure why Eu keeps showing up in these international languages. It's not a very common diphthong. Seriously, even if you just look at Interlingua's source languages, Eu is missing from like half of them. I'm pretty sure it's purely so they can preserve recognizability in the word for Europe. The most common language that's compatible with interlingua phonology is Spanish, which makes sense since that's the most common romance language. Spanish actually isn't compatible since interlingua distinguishes between ya and ja, and Spanish doesn't. This episode has no examples for the grammar, period. This is pretty nitpicky, but why does this pronoun char put the genitive form first? And how exactly is reflexive a case? All in all, I'd say that Interlingua is an interesting case. Although it makes perfect sense to describe it as an unsuccessful international language, its goals don't really line up with what other interlangs try to do. It doesn't care about simplicity or universality. All Interlingua wants is to be easily understood by speakers of Romance languages and languages with large amounts of Romance loanwords. If all I cared about was how well languages met their own goals, then Interlingua would easily be one of the best international languages I've reviewed. However, that's not really what this show is about. What matters more to me is how appealing the goals of a language are. That's a really bad take. Though in the case of Interlingua, its organization is literally the International Language Association, a pretty clear indication it wants to be an IAL, so I think they're just asking to be criticized like an IAL instead of a generic Romlang. That in mind, I'd say I like this episode more than the Volapük episode, but not as much as the Aoi episode, making it the ninth best content critic episode reviewed so far. This episode, we'll be looking at the universal musical language, Sol Ray Sol. I mean, Sol Ray Sol. Its tonemes are C, La, Sol, Fa, Mi, Re, Do. A language made out of pitch might sound vaguely similar to the idea of a tonal language, but Sol Ray Sol is fundamentally different from tonal languages in a few ways. Most importantly, Sol Ray Sol's tonemes are about absolute pitch rather than relative pitch. A high tone in a natural tonal language just needs to be high compared to the other tones in a specific utterance. In Sol Ray Sol, the toneme C, for example, needs to be at the same pitch every time. Yao Misli does a really good job explaining how tonal languages work and how Sol Re Sol differs from that with absolute pitch. Tones can be pronounced in four ways. Short unstressed, short stressed, long unstressed, and long stressed. These correspond to grammar stuff that I'll get to in a bit, but the point is that most of the many ways Sol Re Sol is written have no way of indicating stress or length. I mean, if the stress and length only matter for gender, number, and word class, and since those aren't really necessary for most stuff, it should be fine? Also, more about vocabulary would have been nice, and mentioning how its tiny phonology makes words long and samey. When you're listening to any amount of Sol Sol text being sung or played on an instrument, it doesn't sound very melodic. The sample of actual Sol Re Sol text to prove the point that it doesn't sound very musical should have been included. Really, the review of Sol Re Sol itself isn't outstanding, but the musical moments carry this episode hard, making it feel a lot more fun. That in mind, I'd say I like this episode more than the Laudon episode, but not as much as the Tokipono one, making it the fifth best Conline Critic episode reviewed so far. I'm Jan Misoli, and in this episode, we'll be looking at Lojban, but worse, Loglan. So as you can see, Lojban removed the dental fricative, which makes sense because it's only like in a 25th of all languages, and added the glottal stop, which doesn't make sense because it's in less than like 9 20ths of all languages. Ah yes, it makes absolutely no sense to add a sound in nearly half of all documented natural languages. Anyways, Loglan's vowels are E, U, U, E, A, O, A. Missed opportunity to point out W for U like the absolute abomination it is. 
Hold on a second, does that even matter? Even if you assume that pronunciability is important for internationality, Loklan isn't really trying super hard to be international. Shouldn't it count as an artlang and therefore be immune to this sort of phonological criticism? Well, this is something I haven't done a great job explaining, but my classification of conlangs into innerlangs and artlangs is almost completely arbitrary. Internationality doesn't need to be the primary goal of a conlang for me to count it as an innerlang. Loklan claims that its logical nature, quote, would not unsuit it to be an international auxiliary tongue for every man. That means internationality was at least somewhat taken into account when Loglan was designed and therefore means that I'll be calling it an innerlang. Just because the creator of Loglan arrogantly said it would be fine as an IAL doesn't mean Lojban, which hardly makes such a claim, should also be judged as an IAL. Sure, like it makes logical sense to write Sha with C. As I mentioned earlier in the Vakil section, C actually doesn't make sense for Sha, at least in comparison to X. The grammar of Loglan is more or less the same as Lojban. If there's any significant differences, I didn't notice them. Reading about Loglan grammar felt like reading about Lojban grammar, except things were referred to with slightly more sensible names. Maybe describe Loglan grammar at all instead of saying, yeah, it's basically Lojban, especially considering they did an extremely poor job of explaining its grammar in the Lojban episode to begin with. Overall, this episode is a fine enough time, its criticisms with phonology are pretty reasonable, and the quality doesn't feel the worst, even if it could be better. That in mind, I'd say I like this episode more than the Igade episode, but not as much as the Volapük episode, making it the 12th best content critic episode reviewed so far. I'm Jan Misoli, and in this episode, well, you know what they say. They say that's the episode we're doing. Not to mention languages like Tamil that don't have any sort of voicingness distinction at all. Tamil actually has a voicing distinction, at least with plosives between vowels, where phonetic ba da ga are contrasted with geminated pa ta ka. This is grammar claims to be simple, which is a pretty generous description. It certainly is consistent with how its grammar works, but that results in constructions that aren't very languagey. Uh, linguistic? Uh, it, it doesn't seem like a language, is my point. Unnatural. The word you're looking for is unnatural. Any elaboration on how the grammar or syntax work and why they're natural? No? Okay. Vakil. Guys, look, it's the birth of the Vakil outro. This episode feels like the Vakil episode, but more polished, less harsh, and less funny. It's still a good time though, and all of its criticisms are valid. But enough of what I have to say, let's hear more about Zaysay from the man, the myth, the legend, Jack Eisenman. Hi, I'm Jack Eisenman creator of Vodgil, Zese, and other languages. I have an interesting relationship with Conlang Critic. His videos poke fun at my Conlangs and are satirical in nature. Vodgil in particular has become an internet meme because of Conlang Critic. However, in life I've learned that it's better to use feedback constructively rather than to become defensive, especially on the internet. Conlang Critic does make valid criticisms about my Conlangs. I agree with him that the phonology of Vodgil is not internationally friendly, and that the grayscale alphabet is impractical. I agree with him that spoken zese is ambiguous, because the brackets aren't pronounced. I incorporated his feedback into my last conlang, Breadspeak. Thanks to Conlang Critic, I think Breadspeak is my best constructed language yet. However, Conlang Critic's videos aren't without fault. He ranked zese against international auxiliary languages, but I never intended zese to be an interlang. After making Vodgil, I realized that making a globally accepted interlang is a bit of a pipe dream. As a result, I have not attempted to make an interlang since Vodgil. Otherwise, I agree with Conlang Critic's assessments of my Conlangs. His videos have good presentation value, and he provides witty commentary. I hope he continues to motivate aspiring Conlangers to produce their best work. That in mind, I'd say I like this episode more than the Tokipona episode, but not as much as the Esperanto one, making it the fourth best Conlang Critic episode reviewed so far. I'm Jan Misli, and in this episode we'll be looking at the American language in 3000 AD, Futuris. Does it even count as a Conlang? I don't know, but it'll still be fun to talk about probably. And where'd ye even come from? Why the heck would people start saying ye? I may not know why, but the word yeet came into popular usage soon after this episode released. Also, you know, year. The episode basically goes over the sound changes described in future Reese and comments on them. They're good and valid criticisms, but the video feels lacking, probably because future Reese hardly counts as a conlang. Overall, this isn't an episode I look forward to rewatching, but it's good on its own and does a good job commenting on the sound changes. It isn't boring to watch and feels like there are no major errors, for once. That in mind, I'd say that I like Futuries more than I like Klingon, but not as much as I like Fluid Lang, making it the 6th best interlang refute so far. Never mind, I just realized Jan Beasley accidentally called Futuries and the other artlangs interlangs Lamau. 
That in mind, I'd say I like this episode more than the Soul Ray Soul episode, but not as much as the Tokipono one, making this the sixth best Conlang Critic episode reviewed so far. Thank you to Louis, Borges, Gomide, a duck, and a whole bunch of other people who requested after I already announced that I'm doing this one for requesting this episode. The small list is at the end of every episode. Please look there before you request an episode I already said I'm doing. This episode holds the record for the longest portion of the video being just thanking people for requesting, with about 5.2% and is also the shortest Conlang Critic episode, period. I'm Jan Misely, and in this episode, we'll be looking at the elephant in the room, Lingua Franca Nova. This is the single best nickname Jan Misely has given to a Conlang in an opening segment. Beautiful. Nothing we haven't seen before, and nothing too bad, though it does actually fail to be fully compatible with Spanish, the most common romance language, so, you know, not great. I also just realized that Ha being an elephant single-handedly makes it incompatible with the phonologies of French, Italian, and to a lesser extent Portuguese, the other three major romance languages. Oops. Student. Any examples of the grammar at all instead of just putting grammar? This is a decent feel-good episode, and its sparing criticisms are fair, but as the description feels very lackluster content-wise. That in mind, I'd say I like this episode more than the Interlingua episode, but not as much as the Aoi one, making it the 12th best Conline Critic episode reviewed so far. I'm Jan Beasley, and in this episode we'll be looking at what I'm pretty sure is Inner Slavic. The audio quality jumps off a cliff between the Elephant and Inner Slavic episodes. The version of Inner Slavic I'll be focusing on in this episode was based on two other versions, called Sloviansky and Neo-Slavonic, created in 2006 and 2009 respectively, each by groups of people too numerous to properly credit. This version is a unification of the two, also created by a large committee, which started being made in summer 2017. Maybe list at least some of the names of the people who created the three conlangs you're talking about instead of just having the flag there, or mention that this version of Inner Slavic is also called Medjuslofiansky. For example, the Inner Slavic word for human, Človek, is very similar to the Russian, Belarusian, Polish, Czech, Slovak, Slovene, Bulgarian, and Macedonian words for the same thing. The Macedonian word shown for person is an adjective, not the noun form. The word for water, voda, is similar to Russian, and the Russian example for water is not the dictionary nominative form, which is voda. So, here's the thing. I don't speak any Slavic languages. Inner Slavic isn't made for me. I could go on describing how Inner Slavic's grammar works, but honestly, it wouldn't actually be all that helpful. Yes, it would! It's very disappointing that the effort wasn't put in to do basic research on the grammar of Slavic languages, or mentions Inner Slavic's grammar whatsoever. That in mind, I don't feel confident enough in my opinions about Inner Slavic to give it an actual ranking. The decision not to rank Inner Slavic is fair, but makes it feel like the entire video has just no point. The first half of the episode is fine enough, even if not super descriptive, but it completely falls off with a complete lack of describing grammar and leaves a bad taste in my mouth. I was there, waiting during the hiatus between the Elephant and Inner Slavic episodes, and in hindsight this was a massive disappointment. That in mind, I'd say I like this episode more than I like the Lojban episode, but not as much as the Klingon one, making it the 22nd best Conlang Critic episode reviewed so far. Thank you to Aduck, Folkman, and probably others for requesting this episode. Welcome to Conlang Critic, the roughly annual show that gets facts wrong about your favorite Conlang. I'm Jan Misely, and in this episode, we'll be looking at the language of the people, Folksprach. Folksprach is a Germanic zonal oxlang that started its development in 1995. The sheer amount of lippiness with the quality is really, really bad, to the point where it triggers my SPD. For those who don't know, I have Sensory Processing Disorder, or SBD for short, which means I'm more sensitive to certain unpleasant senses, and in most cases, sounds, and they cause me actual mental and physical pain. Take for example Lycan's channel. He makes really good videos about conlang creation, but I can't listen to them because the specific campfire ambient noise he uses triggers my SBD and causes actual pain. I'm still giving him a shout out whether he likes it or not. Anyways, back to the Folksprock episode. Digisk Folksprock's orthography is relatively straightforward. It's meant to be intuitive for speakers of Germanic languages, and I think it works okay for that. It avoids diacritics, sticking entirely to the plain Latin alphabet. More examples of how the orthography works would have been nice. Speaking of pronunciation of loans, loan words from non-Germanic languages are more or less written and pronounced the same way as they are in their sources, even if the source language has sounds not present in Folksprock. Or any example about how non-Germanic loan words are written. My verdict is that, yes, these words are pretty recognizable. Or letting the audience see more vocabulary themselves so they can judge how recognizable Folksbrock's words are. Regardless, this episode does a good job at both being descriptive and giving helpful and valid criticism, and truly feels like the transition between the qualities of seasons 2 and 3. Speaking of which, the review of the Conlangs being reviewed for season 3 is so hype, ah. 
That in mind, I'd say I like this episode more than the Tokipona episode, but not as much as the Zeisei one, making it the 5th best Conline Critic episode reviewed so far. I'm going to be criticizing less from this point because Season 3 is when the quality of the episodes goes from being a guilty pleasure to being genuinely very good. Thank you to literally everyone for requesting this episode. Welcome to Conline Critic, the show that gets facts wrong about your favorite Conline. I'm Jan Misley, and in this episode, we'll be looking at the language of we who ride, Dothraki. Anyway, Dothraki's consonants are m, n, t, j, g, k, d, j, g, f, th, s, sh, h, h, v, z, j, w, l, r. The sound reading section is a bit slow in this episode. As it turns out, it sounds a whole lot like Arabic and Russian among people who don't know what Arabic or Russian sound like. After a uvular stop, everything moves around like this. You mean after the uvular stop, because there's only one in Dothraki. Adverbs in Dothraki are a part of speech separate from adjectives, so the adverb chik, meaning well, is completely unrelated to the word for good. If you're gonna bring up chik for well as being different from the word for good, then show the word for good? Anyway, I would just like to take this opportunity to point out that DJP got the base conversion from decimal to seximal wrong here. 100 is 2-4-Z-4 in seximal, not 4-4-Z-4. That's what I'm resorting to now, insulting people I respect. Overall, while it feels like Season 3 needs a bit more time to fully get its footing, the Dothraki episode is a massive step up in analysis, while still managing to be entertaining and have some funny gags. All in all, I'd say I like this episode more than the Esperanto episode, but not as much as the K-pop one, making this the third best content critic episode reviewed so far. I'm Jan Misoli, and in this episode we'll be looking at the new international auxiliary language, Novio. The international auxiliary language is a popular genre of conline. I should be clear here that when I say international auxiliary language, or IAL, I'm talking about a specific subset of international languages, one even more specific than the clunky name international auxiliary language suggests. For my purposes, IAL specifically refers to a global international auxiliary language, a language designed to be used for communication between people who otherwise wouldn't have a language in common regardless of where the given people are from. This is a specific type of auxlang, which is a specific type of innerlang, which is a specific type of conlang. I bring all of this up because in the past I've been inconsistent with terminology, referring to all languages that are even remotely international as innerlangs regardless of what goals they have. Good character development from Jan Misely did not treat all auxlangs like IALs. Novial was created in direct response to the various failed attempts to implement an IAL that came previously, notably Volapük, Esperanto, Edo, and even some languages I haven't made videos about yet, like Idiom Neutral, Latin Without Inflections, and Interlingue, a language which is completely different from Interlingue, I promise. In an international language, Otto goes through the criticisms that he had for each of these conlangs, making him some sort of, yes, person who critiques constructed languages or something. I would have loved to see Jespersen's juicy criticisms of other IALs, but that's fine. Anyway, time for everyone's favorite segment. What's the most commonly spoken language whose consonant in the Tory is incompatible with that of this particular international language? It's that game show I love so much. Hindi. 615 million speakers. The sound pha is rare outside of loanwords, but perfectly fine being here. The phoneme pha never occurs outside of loanwords, although in urban areas, aspirated pa which does appear in native words, is frequently realized as fa. Spanish. 534 million speakers. Somewhat of a stretch. Ba and za are allophones of the same phoneme in Spanish, so there's a risk of those being confused for each other. I'd say for Spanish speakers failing to distinguish b and v, wa would probably be a better substitute for va, but this is probably debatable. This, by the way, is the ideal way to handle gender in an IAL. You don't have to specify gender, but if you want to, no gender is treated as the default. That's literally all I ask for, a system where it's possible to talk about people without mentioning gender, and where women aren't considered to be a type of man. The bar is practically underground, and yet IALs like Esperanto manage to dig under it anyway. Love to see Jan Misli staying woke. I love the sass they have with the verbs and derivational suffixes while describing them. As you've surely gathered, Novial is just as Eurocentric as every other major international auxiliary language. Not all major IALs, since Lidapla literally exists, as well as other modern IALs which actually put in the effort to source their vocabularies from around the world. Overall, this episode is very mature while still providing criticism and entertainment. It feels like the best of classic conline critic polished to a far greater degree. All in all, I'd say I like this episode more than the Vakil episode, making this the best Conline Critic episode reviewed so far. 
I'm Jan Liesley, and in this episode, we'll be looking at an engineered set of lenses, the IS language. IS is an ongoing art project made by Stuart Davis. Over this is the only Conlang Critic episode with a dog in it, so that's how you know it's good. IS is designed for personal use in art, and isn't described anywhere comprehensively, unless that's just buried somewhere in one of his Patreon posts. Imagine not temporarily joining their Patreon for the sole purpose of research, coward. The IS language's vowels are, eh, uh... Ah yes, schwa, my favorite close vowel. Also, why not label the diphthongs in their own row instead of clunkily fitting them in with the monothongs, or do the thing of having a separate chart for diphthongs like the majority of other episodes? I know it's hard to tell, but if you look closely, you just might notice that the letter of the is alphabet that represents this sound happens to be exactly the same thing as the corresponding letter of the International Phonetic Alphabet. Stuart Davis isn't a public figure. Is isn't a very well-known conling. Then why did you review it? Well, I know it's because a handful of people requested it, but you actively chose to not review Pegakibo, you could have easily vetoed this. By the tone of the video, it feels like... That said, I strongly dislike Is. ...comes out of nowhere. Conceptually, the episode can only be so good, but is about as good as it could have been, remaining mature and valid with its analysis and criticism. All in all, I'd say I like this episode more than the Volksbrock episode, but not as much as the Zaysay one, making this the 7th best Colin Critic episode reviewed so far. I'm Jan Meesley, and in this episode we'll be looking at the language of the heavens, Dursk. Dursk's consonants are... Jan Meesley consonant pronunciation ASMR returns! For those curious, Dursk has the exact same number of consonants as Ithquil at 53. Ithquil still has the largest inventory covered on Conline Critic though, thanks to its vowels and tonemes. Phonorens, or just runs, are an alternative to syllables created for Isarok's earlier languages, such as Ratsaw. Ratsaw is a beautiful name for a language. It would make more sense if the writing system Dursk borrowed from was an Abjad or an Abugida or something, where it's normal to not write vowels that can be inferred through context. I don't think it's best to suggest Abugidas normally don't write vowels. They have default inherent vowels for consonants, but they write every single other vowel, of which languages that use Abugidas coincidentally tend to have a lot of. I don't have that much to say, it's a good analysis and critique, its jabs are fine but also feels a bit low energy. At any rate, I don't have the best time with this one, and don't revisit it unless I'm watching all the Conline Critic episodes. All in all, I'd say I like this episode more than the Futurese episode, but not as much as the Tokipono one, making this the 10th best Conline Critic episode reviewed so far. I'm Jan Misali, and in this episode we'll be looking at the same language world language, Sambasa. Sambasa, also known as Sambasa Mundialect, was created by Dr. Oliver Simon, first published in 2007. While it is more regular than any major natural language, Oliver goes out of his way to make Sambasa feel natural. Why is R uh analyzed as it is on the chart, far away from both R and H? After all, at least none of them have anything remotely as bad as I'm sure there do exist people who are able to say without any problems. And that's why I'm inviting you, the viewer, to take the hashtag challenge. All you need to do is record audio of yourself saying the word out loud. Okay guys, I'm gonna do the challenge. Here's a declension table. These suffixes are added to nouns and adjectives depending on case, number, and gender. But only if you want to, and only if it sounds good. The information contained in these euphonic vocalization suffixes is completely redundant, and is already indicated with other things. These are only here if you just really want to add a suffix to a noun or an adjective declined for case, number, and gender. In Dr. Olivier Simon's defense, he could have made the case system so much more convoluted, especially with making prepositions go with nouns in the accusative instead of having the case vary. What you're looking at here is a table of the various suffixes used for verb conjugation in Sambasa. I know this looks like it's a lot of stuff to keep track of, but don't worry, it's actually much, much more complicated than it looks. Check Brain whether the incorrect Brain conjugation is plus to pronounce. It becomes the second category of verbs is called well, unstressed and unstressed and which I The have verb to section is a comedic mask and it's 10 out of 10 well, based on the examples I provided. E. Despite most of what I've said in the past several minutes, Sambasa isn't like completely horrible. 
I'm sure a younger version of myself would just say, it's bad, and leave it at that, but Sambasa really has some good ideas, which are mostly found in its vocabulary. Overall, this episode feels so mature, funny, and valid with criticism. It is the perfect length. Some of the season 3 episodes can be a bit too long for my tastes, but this is relatively short and condensed while still going in satisfying detail. The phonology section is peak, the orthography section is peak, the grammar section is peak, and the vocabulary section is peak. The only problem I have with this episode is that the audio quality at the beginning has some noticeable lip smacking, otherwise this episode is near perfect to me. If it were a fictional language, Sambasa would be one of my favorites. That statement feels so mature. All in all, I'd say I like this episode more than the Noveal episode, making this the best Conlang Critic episode reviewed so far. Although, admittedly, someone who isn't a fan of the episode is Dr. Olivier Simon himself. Quote, Mitch Haley, aka Jan Meesley, had announced in advance he would make an episode on Sambasa, as he always makes a list. However, I was already wondering. If I remember well, he makes one episode for each month, but it takes at least two months for most people to master the basics of Sambasa, and even one more month to get comfortable with it. The problem is that Mitch has a bias that every conlang should be learnable in the shortest time possible, or maybe even be just a relix of English? The issue with such projects is that they don't go beyond basic phrases. On the contrary, as I explained in my introduction to Alice in Domsenland, we require an oxlang for difficult translation matters. While most people already go along nowadays with a smattering of English or the local language for basic matters, I thought I should warn him but finally decided not to interfere. And the disaster happened. If you look at the videos that Mitch released during this period, he published a few of them about his second passion, music of video games. I suppose he finally realized he couldn't master Sambasa in a few weeks, as he could for Tokipona, and decided not to make a real review, but rather a parody to amuse his fan base. This is visible in the fact that he obviously pronounces R's as if he was trying to get a throat cancer, while the rest is rather good, and added a secondary episode on verbs, while Sambasa only has three irregular verbs, and the conjugations of the other ones can be deduced from their shape. Furthermore, because of course he didn't slash would take the time for a closer examination, he admits the amount of resources that Sambasa has, translations, dictionaries, etc., which is only challenged by a few major conlangs like Esperanto. A counterexample is given by Aronora in his own video. By the way, the fact that Mitch didn't make a lot of research is shown by his English pronunciation of my own name. While it takes 5 seconds to google for Sambasa, and to read in the first results that it was devised by French linguist Olivier Simon. Anyway, Cinderin. Cinderin is one of the two languages people mean when they say Elvish language, the other being Quenya. I would say that Cinderin was created for the Lord of the Rings series, but really it's the other way around. The Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings were created so that Tolkien had a reason to have created as many languages as he did. Tra. Normally, I don't point out the way Yami Isli pronounces things, but voices tr like tr. The way it works in Cinderin is pretty similar to how it specifically works in Welsh, judging by this one chart on Wikipedia. Anyway, Cinderin's vowels are... Now hold on a second, there is definitely more to it than that. Is that Edgar from Artifexian? The Artifexian crossover is the most hype moment in cinematic history, though it'd be nice if there was background music. Artifexian talking without background music is mildly cursed. You know what, screw it. Here's the entire Artifexian section, but with their typical background music. Good morning, Measley. I think it's worth pointing out how constant mutation works in insular Celtic languages in a bit more detail, don't you? I guess, but I don't actually know that much about Celtic languages to begin with. Well, given that I learned a little bit of Irish in school, I'd be glad to explain a thing or two about how constant mutations work. Sure, that would be great. Take it away, Edgar. Consonant mutation in Irish happens through either lenition, the shevu, or eclipsis, the uru. The shavu occurs in these environments and has the effect of mutating these initial consonants into these consonants. Basically, stops become fricatives, plus some extras. Side note, all Irish consonants, apart from ha, come in two forms, a broad velarized form and a slender palatalized form, hence the doubling on this list. Regardless, the shavu is signaled in the orthography by placing a h after the initial consonant. So for example, cot, cat, Mohat, my cat. The Uru works the same way. Eclipsis occurs in these environments and has the effect of mutating these initial consonants into these. Basically, voicing voice stops and turning voice stops into nasals. This is signaled in the orthography by placing the new consonant before the old consonant. So, cot, cat, or got, our cat. And it's not only consonants that get affected, vowels too, through a thing called NT or H prothesis. 
Basically, in certain circumstances, T, H, or N go before an initial vowel. Og, young. Tirnanog, land of youth. Ishka, water. Antishka, the water. Ian, birds. Nahain, the birds. Now, I cannot emphasize just how cursory of an overview this is, so please, please, please check out the links in the description to read up more on the epicness that is Irish. Welsh, being another Celtic language, does something very similar to Irish. Its consonant mutations are known as the tregla. There are three main types, the soft mutation, the tregla medal, the nasal mutation, the tregla trunol, and the aspirated mutation, tregla chlais, all of which cause these mutations. And like Irish, many environments trigger these mutations. Links in the description. For example, the possessive my triggers nasal mutation. Cath, cat, vunghath, my cat. That should have been a voiceless nasal, but I cannot even so. Moving on, the possessive your triggers soft mutation. Cath, cat, the gath, your cat. And the possessive her triggers aspirated mutation. Cath, cat, a hath, her cat. Note the different orthographic strategies here. Irish inserts letters, Welsh replaces letters. So if Irish were written like Welsh, it wouldn't be on van, the woman, with a H. Rather, on van, with a V. And like Mitch already pointed out, Sindarin is essentially riffing off Welsh, which, as a proud Irishman, makes me a little sad. But, as a fan of the greater Celtosphere, makes me exceedingly happy. Thanks, Edgar. Thank you for having me. Hey, you should come back to my channel sometime. Oh yeah, we could talk about numbering systems again. That was fun. I mean, we are definitely already doing that. You hadn't even decided that I should be in this video until weeks into the process of writing our second number systems collaboration. Hey, stop ruining the illusion. Oh, okay, person who is absolutely having a conversation with me in real time right now. I should probably let you get back to the review. Right, see you later. Until next time, Edgar out. I also love the native lang crossover that totally happens. And here to discuss what it means for a writing system to be featural is Josh from Native Lang. Hello, welcome, thanks for being on the show. This is also where things get the most speculative, so take everything here with 64.8 milligrams of salt. The Cinderin episode isn't the most entertaining, but does a very good job describing the language. All in all, I'd say I like this episode more than the Is episode, but not as much as the Zaysay one, making this the 8th best Conline Critic episode reviewed so far. I'm Jan Misley, and in this episode we'll be looking at polysynthetic Esperanto, Polyespo. But everything I could find pointed me to one clear conclusion. This is the worst Conling I have ever heard of, and I have to see more of it. If you can get someone else to join the Polyespo organization, which exists, you'll automatically get 20% of their membership dues and 20% of all money they give to the organization over their lifetime. When Cherokee is written in the Latin alphabet, its nasal vowel is written with the letter V. I actually think that's a good solution. V was historically a vowel letter, after all, and Cherokee has no use for it as a consonant. Why the heck does it say I? Okay, I looked it up and that's not the Latin letter I. That's Cherokee syllable uh. Here are all the other Cherokee syllables with that vowel because why the heck not? In polyespo, nasal schwa, uh, is written, I kid you not, with the number two. Polyespo was the perfect language for conline critic. A complete abomination that Yom Isley breaks down in excruciating detail how god-awful it is. He relapses to half the video being about the phonology and orthography, but justifiably so, and evokes vibes of early conline critic reviewing really bad conlangs, but with the detail of season three. I love the vocabulary section, with Jan Meesley casually giving a bit of conlanging advice to a convicted murderer, and the ending message is genuinely heartfelt. All in all, I'd say I like this episode more than the Vakil episode, but not as much as the Novial one, making this the third best conlang critic episode reviewed so far. I'm Jan Meesley, and in this episode we'll be looking at the verbless art lang, Kaelin. Kaelin is a fictional language created by Sylvia Sotomayor, who has been working on it since 1980. Kaelin's consonants are... Mah. N, 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 p, t, s, k, k, h, s. The pronunciation of the consonants is a bit slow, and Jan Meesley completely butchered sh for some reason. S. But the vowel section is nice ASMR. E, u, e, u, e, o, e, o, a, a. It was also very neat seeing Yamisli figure out Kalen's phototactics with regards to his consonant clusters. 
Though I guess to get a full understanding of the phonotactics, I'd have to check every single possible pair of consonants to see if they're tested in the word list. And that sounds like a lot of work. I don't really want to do that. I mean, I'd have to check, like, what, eight NIF pairs of phonemes? Yeah, I'm not doing that. So here's a table showing which pairs of consonants exist in words in the Canon Dictionary. I do, however, have a super nitpicky complaint about the way it's presented. On her website, Sylvia, for some reason, uses slashes to mark the romanization, and she does the same thing when giving examples from other languages. This caused seconds of confusion, where I assumed based on convention that this was supposed to be phonemic transcription. The slight nitpicking of the romanization feels reasonable and has a bit of that Misalian charm. So what Kaylin has instead of verbs is a set of four words called relationals, which are really just verbs. So exactly as I suspected, Kaylin just relabels its verbs as something else. That's not really fair, though. Kaylin's relationals work like verbs functionally, but they don't carry any semantic meaning. And like, the fact that there's only four of them still shouldn't just be written off. There definitely is truth to the claim that Kaelin is a verbless language. It feels so mature that Yam easily accepted that Kaelin has four basically verbs, and praised that there were only four, even though it could have been fewer. This episode is just a joy to watch. It's uplifting to see Yam easily like a conlang they're reviewing so much. It does a good job at describing the language, and it just has good vibes. Conlang critic isn't going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> all in all, I'd say I like this episode more than the K-Bop episode, but not as much as the Vakil one, making this the fifth best Conline Critic episode reviewed so far. I'm Jan Misley, and in this episode, we'll be looking at the language of the planet, Lingua de Planeta. I'm gonna be completely honest with you, I'm a little biased in favor of this one. Lingua de Planeta is my favorite fully fleshed out IAL by a long shot, and my second favorite Conlang in general behind Chokipona. In other words, if Yam Isli is too mean to lead Apola, I will go cry for 13 hours. I would like to use this review of Lingua de Planeta as a way of demonstrating what a conlang is to those of you who are unfamiliar with conlangs or even linguistics. And for any cute frauds out there who have already watched every single episode of Conlang Critic and have had no trouble understanding the advanced linguistics concepts, it's still useful to get a refresher on the basics. Plus, I'll be putting my own Misalian twist on it so you won't get bored. The explanatory sections are fine, but they feel redundant on repeat viewings, and the beginning in particular is too explanation heavy, though that's probably unavoidable. And the video does pick back up in entertainment value when the video starts being more review-centric. Most major languages have at least two sets of plosives. Languages like French distinguish between stops with voicedness, with all stops being unaspirated. Languages like Mandarin distinguish between stops with aspiration, with all stops being unvoiced. Languages like Hindi distinguish between voicedness and aspiration separately. And then there's languages like English, which distinguish between their two stop series with a combination of voicedness and aspiration. Yam Isli has gotten so professional with their video quality over the years that it's a bit jarring to see screenshotted Wikipedia pages of French, Mandarin, Hindi, and English phonologies instead of being copy-pasted into their own format. There are a few more things worth addressing, which I think are best incorporated into. The show that exists to draw out the already bloated phonology segments of Conline Critic episodes to be even more unnecessarily long than they were before. And now, here's your lovely host, list of languages by total number of speakers from Wikipedia, a free encyclopedia. Welcome, Lingua de Planeta. It's great to have you here on the show. I am talking to a language right now. There are quite a few audio hiccups in this episode. I like some of the choices Lee Depla makes here, like how to design you never But to be fair, I wouldn't want to put in the effort of perfecting audio for a nearly 40 minute long video either. This is the most commonly used set of vowels across different languages, and for an international auxiliary language, there isn't really any reason to use anything else. Yan's measly character development, finally accepting that for IELTS, five vowels is superior to three. I just now realized that not a single conlang Yan Misli has reviewed has only three vowels. The feminine and masculine genders in Indo-European languages have almost nothing to do with the gender genders they're named after. In German, the actual literal word for girl is grammatically neuter. It's almost completely arbitrary which words belong in which class in different languages. Usually the gender that nouns have in gendered language isn't completely arbitrary. For non-human nouns, it's usually based on the ending of the noun. For example, in Spanish, nouns ending in O tend to be masculine, and ones ending in A are typically feminine. And in Russian, nouns ending in hard consonants in the nominative are usually masculine, ones ending in a are usually feminine, and nouns ending in a or o in their nominative forms are neuter. Yam Isli was nice to Lidepla, so I say this episode is good. Is Lidepla the language that finally solved the impossible puzzle of designing a good IAL? 
No, not by a long shot. It does better than average, but the bar is very, very low. Lidepla did its best, and its best is just okay. Honestly, it's a bit mean that Jan Measley keeps existing that there are no good ILs. I think Lidepla is good, and while there are other World Source ILs that I have problems with, I'd still call them good and would not mind if they replaced English as a global oxlang tomorrow. All in all, I'd say I like this episode more than the Esperanto episode, but not as much as the Dothraki episode, making this the 8th best Colin Critic episode reviewed so far. I'm Jan Meesley, and in this episode, we'll be looking at the collaborative con pigeon, Viosa. I'm going to be doing something pretty different for this episode, because Viosa is a special case. I spoke to several members of the Viosa community about their experiences with the language. I like that it says, I did a journalism. I also love Salp's Aaron profile picture. Aaron is free serotonin. To me, this isn't really an episode of Conlang Critic, since there's no actual criticism, and Viosa blurs the line between what is and what isn't a Conlang, but I think the way that Jan Meesley handled it was good, and all the interviews with Viosa speakers are really wholesome. Speaking of Viosa speakers, here's Nico Miko, one of the people interviewed, to give their thoughts on the episode. Alright, so first question is, uh, what are your thoughts on the Conlang Critic episode about Viosa? So I think it was a really, uh, really well-made episode, first of all, like just from the standpoint of me, their own content. Um, they do really good stuff. Uh, and it was kind of exciting to see that they took such a big deviation from their usual presentation of conlangs for hours. You know, like the format was much different. Um, they announced kind of right at the beginning, they were like, I'm not going to review it in the same way. So I was really proud that we got so much coverage from it, essentially, but also that it was such a, um, that Viosa's like unique nature kind of prompted so just such a change in, in, in the content format, essentially. It was really cool to see that happen. Um, and of course, as an after effect, we got tons of traffic. We uh, the, the size of the server ballooned from like 20 people to it's over a thousand now. I think it might be close to- It's only 20 people originally? Um, well, the, you know, people would come and go. Uh, um, as in like 20 active people, you mean? Yes, yeah, 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 like 20 like, ah, really see. active people. But if we if we want to say like the actual, the, like the number of just accounts on the server was probably closer to like maybe 50 or 60. I'd assume uh, a video that got over 100,000 views about a niche language would obviously balloon the server size. It was immediate too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Besides uh, the server size, I suppose, uh, the next question is, what impact would you say the episode had on the Viosa community? Um, I would say that the effects are like kind of varied. For one thing, we started out initially with the, with this very much like um, everybody had a a contribution language that they brought to the table, and we all contributed words from uh, you know words in syntactic formations from that language. And then over time, things kind of became solidified. And then around the year anniversary, we kind of made like a public. We made a post on uh, our conlangs like. Fios has been going on for a year. Here's kind of like a declassification of some of this stuff. Like I think uh, we included some translations in the initial like publication. Um, and then because the original format of like individualistic contribution was so prominent in the video, when people came and joined, the dynamics kind of shifted more to back towards that because where we had kind of like ruled out the no English rule kind of in the time before the video happened, it kind of came back because we had to decide, well, like, how do we handle the process of teaching new people? Like, at this point, we have an established culture of teaching that way, so it kind of reverted and became uh, strong again. So that's one thing, was that we, we brought back the no translation thing uh, a bit more strongly. And secondly, when people came in, they expected to contribute a little bit more, which I think has led to kind of um, not necessarily a ton of contribution from new languages, but um, new variations that didn't exist as strongly before. And um, perspectives on that uh, definitely vary within the community. Like um, some people think that um, there's a lot of divergence uh, now where there wasn't before, but at the same time, there are like little clumps of people who are like mutually very intelligible. So this divergence is kind of a little bit more systematic than maybe some people think it is. So that's two things that I would say. Um, increased variation and kind of a reversion to an earlier state based on like how it was presented. Uh, the last question I have is uh, regarding the Viosa words featured in the episode, how would you say their publicity or their being exposed to like 
thousands of people affected them? Did they get replaced, modified, or were they reinforced? Actually, I think, um, thinking back on it, honestly, I think <laughs> it was kind of ignored. <laughs> oh. Like, I don't think it produced, like, a uh, significant effect on the words or the usage, because I think that the number of, like, lexical items that were actually included in the video with translation was so small that ultimately it's only it's only a couple of words. So yeah. when, when people are first, like, learning and accumulating a massive vocabulary that's, like, you know, between 200 and 500 words, I don't know how big most people's, like, working set is, but as that expands, it kind of just, those, those that initial impression that might have been based on the translation kind of yeah. gets lost in, like, the mass of other things that they're working on. The reason I put that question is because I remember when I watched the video, I'm like, well, if I were to learn Viosa right now, I'd imagine they'd be like, oh, all of these words are in the Conlang Critic episode with translation. Let's just stop saying them now. Yeah, and I like, um, that's really interesting because that's a totally valid approach. Like we definitely had a fear sort of, or like a, we have an aversion to the translation, partially because it's like we're simulating pigeon formation, but also because there's this um, state of ambiguity with how words are conceptualized by both the speaker and the listener. There's like this state of ambiguity that we wanted to preserve. And we figured that because people's competency in English is generally like quite solidified, like any any language that you translate into has like a huge history. So whatever word you pick is very specifically tailored to the meaning you're trying to express. So as soon as you translate something out of Viosa, it gets made concrete in a way that it is not in Viosa. Or at least that's one of the things that we wanted to avoid. Um, but it doesn't seem like it actually was an issue. I think the, the, the idea of just not using those words anymore, like never crossed anybody's mind actually. Um, I think anytime that we do like a disclosure where we're like, just so, so you know, we usually don't do translation, but we're gonna do it for this one. I don't think it really has a an altering effect on the state of the language as it's as it's used. Yeah, I think I think we kind of tend to stay true to it anyway. I have like literally three notes in total about the Viosa episode that I feel like commenting on. There's not really that much to comment on, I think, compared to a lot of Conline Critic episodes from an outsider mm -hmm. perspective. Because yeah, it's just people like, being interviewed um, like, and it's nice and wholesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I agree. It it did feel very wholesome too. Like we all got in like a video call and like watched it together with oh, like, nice. a, like a YouTube synchronizer or whatever. Yeah, it was really it was really cute. Um, because a lot of people who aren't like super active anymore came back to like do the viewing, and um, oh. it was really exciting because we had the same thought. We were like, oh, this is like a wholesome experience. This is a wholesome episode, and then like people started DMing us kind of like as soon as the video was over, we started getting DMs from people like, like hey, I know you from the Viosa episode. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Which was kind of, I don't know, it was magical. It was like pretty cool. I would say um, maybe maybe one effect that I didn't really uh, mention earlier was like, because I didn't necessarily have a, a big reaction to this experience, but some people did. Um, we kind of didn't think through <laughs> how we were going to accept like the volume of new people and the server was originally like i said it was a, a small number of people and it was kind of like a friend server to a certain extent we we just kind of started bringing people into that instead of making like a new public server which um i don't know had had an alienating effect on on some uh, earlier members which i think is i think is regrettable but i think it's also like I don't know. We didn't know any better. <laughs> we didn't know that that was like necessarily going to happen. Um, That's fair. Uh, there's not much we could have done about it, really. Yeah. It's been coming on for years. Yeah. <laughs> Which is crazy. I didn't, yeah. I never thought. I don't know. I didn't. I didn't really think about how long it's been. All right. That's pretty much everything that I have. Uh, thank you so much for doing this interview. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, do you want me like shout anything out? I mean, the server's still public. We're still we're yeah still open teaching people. I'm still there. Oh, there is one little thing. We have been working on uh, an official translation for Minecraft. Um, Ooh. Yeah, which is really cool. So like, it won't be a resource pack. It'll be like in the base game. Um, whenever it gets um, accepted, right now we're at like a, it's on, it's on Crowdin, which is like a crowdsourced translation platform. And it's at something like 95% translated, 70% approved. So it should be, it should be getting in at some point. I'm not sure if there's some criteria we're missing, but it's on the way. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really excited about that, actually. Like, totally Heck thrilled. Yeah. <laughs> well, either way, I have appreciated your time. I have appreciated um, yours. 
Thank you. Huh. All in all, I'd say that I like this episode more than the Esperanto episode, but not as much as the Lingua de Planeta one, making this the ninth best Conline Critic episode reviewed so far. I'm Jan Measley, and in this episode, we'll be looking at the language that... I mean, it's not that it's hard to pronounce the name, it's more that it's hard to say its name out loud in a way that makes it clear what language you're talking about. English. English is an international auxiliary language created by Jack Eisenman in 2011. While English 2011 appears to be a modified version of English 1550 to present, it's more accurate to describe it as a completely new language built from the ground up that just happens to be based on English. There's not much I can really say about this inventory from a design standpoint. Like, sure, I could do my normal thing, maybe even bring back that game show segment and talk about individual phonemes that make this less suited for an IAL, but it's not like each of these consonants was selected individually. This inventory is the way it is because of exactly one bad decision, the decision to just copy English. Wait, did that game show not return? No! It does that thing where TC is used for ch? I hate that. Like, I understand the reasoning behind it, but it does not look good. Once again, friendly reminder that approximately zero natural languages that use the Latin alphabet as their primary orthography use C mainly for sh. The following is a part of a translation of the Tower of Babel from Genesis, translated into English by Jack Eisenman specifically for this video. The fact that Eisenman made a translation just for this video is such a gigachad move. I think this episode is emblematic of how a lot of Jan Misley's criticisms got less funny. Like, they went decently hard on Poliespo and Zambasa, but this episode doesn't feel as indulgent or entertaining, even if well made. Honestly, this might just be where Jan Misley started doubting the point of Conline Critic, and the show lost some steam as a result. But really, the problem isn't in the core of the language, it's with its presentation. The Jack Eisenman conlang does not work at all as an international auxiliary language, but it doesn't have to be one. A language with a smallish core vocabulary and minimal programming language like grammar is a pretty decent foundation for an engineered language, as long as there's no pretense of it being designed for international communication. It feels so mature that Jan Misley feels like suggesting Jack Eisenman's conlangs would be fine as engineered langs instead of IELs. Although, as Jack mentioned, Zese is not an interlang and was never claimed to be. All in all, I'd say that I like this episode more than the Futurese episode, but not as much as the Tokipono one, making this the 14th best Conline Critic episode reviewed so far. Welcome to Conline Critic, the show that gets facts wrong about your favorite Conlang. I'm Jan Misley, and this episode we'll be looking at the ancient tongue, Quenya. We're finally here. Welcome to the season finale of Conlang Critic. And what better way to close off this season than with one of the most beloved Conlangs out there? In fiction, Quenya is the ancient language of the High Elves, and it has a role in Middle-earth society similar to the one Latin does in the real world. A featural writing system is one where features of the shapes of individual graphemes indicate some information about what phonemes they represent. Every single linguistics YouTuber has made a video about this topic. Oh, I guess I'm not a real linguistics YouTuber then. Okay, imposter syndrome, you win this round. I don't have too much to say about the episode itself. It's short and sweet, its sparse criticisms are valid, and at the end it gets genuinely emotional both with how good Quenya is and seeing the end of season 3. The ending theme is good too! I love the part where the Tokipono lyrics are written and the writing systems of the Conlangs reviewed. I also love how Hatsune Miku is in the credits. Well deserved, seeing as she made the entirety of season 3. With how much of a downer the High Valyrian episode was, and the continued hiatus that immediately followed it, I think it's safe to call the Quenya episode the essential series finale of Conline Critic, at least for now. All in all, I'd say that I like this episode more than the Lingua de Planeta episode, but not as much as the Dothraki one, making this the 8th best Conline Critic episode reviewed so far. I'm Jan Misley, and in this episode, we'll be looking at the language of nobles, poetry, and dragons, High Valyrian. Highly compressed David J. Peterson jump scare. Hey, is this segment actually useful? It's been a part of this show for so long, I've never really thought to question it. But like, do people get something out of hearing me read through all the consonant phonemes that they wouldn't have gotten from just showing the chart? I like the phonology section. I get something out of that. Blackgill. Blackgill. The Vakil yeah, outro is back! I'm a bit excited. Overall, the first half of the episode is a downer, but understandably so. It's fun when Yam easily can point out a feature that's genuinely neat and they have something to say. Their dilemma is completely valid. This show definitely isn't going anywhere, but after this season is over, it's going to be more in line with the rest of what I make, where new episodes only come out when there's a topic I actually want to discuss. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time, where I'll be reviewing Bliss Symbolics. Joke's on you! There'll never be a next time! Mwahahaha! <laughs>
That said, I'd say I like this episode more than the Folksbrock episode, but not as much as I like the English one, making this the 16th best Colin Critic episode reviewed so far. This is the part of the episode where I'm supposed to give a score. However, the system that I've decided to use for Conline Critic Critic doesn't give Conline Critics numerical scores, but instead ranks them. Of course, since this is the first Conline Critic I've reviewed, I can't compare them to any others. That in mind, Jan Beasley is the best Conline Critic reviewed so far. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time where I'll be reviewing nothing because I'm not making another episode of Conline Critic Critic.